All right, good morning, guys. He is risen. Awesome. You guys got it. I thought I might have to prompt some people, but man, that was awesome. Let's do it again. He is risen. Indeed, he is. We celebrate the resurrection on Resurrection Sunday. This is why we gather on Sunday mornings as a church. Because Jesus rose on a Sunday, we celebrate the resurrection. But what I want us to do this morning is something a little bit different than maybe most Resurrection Sundays, most Easter Sundays. Because I want us to think through, why is resurrection a big deal? Why is it a big deal that Jesus rose from the grave? Who cares if a guy who claimed to be God died and rose again? What does that mean for us? Why is that good news for me? So I want us to think about that. So as many of you know, we've been going through the book of 1 Corinthians, but as we usually do when we go through Christmas, Easter, certain times of the year, we're going to take a little bit of a break from the series we're going through, but we're not going to stop preaching through the Bible. We still love doing that. We believe the Bible is God's word to us, given to understand the person and work of Jesus. It's not a book that explains how we must live a good life. It's not the rule book to life. It's not a bunch of commands that we now have to do in order to be made right with, bleh, to be made right with God. The scripture is given to us to know the character and person of God. And so we want to do that, whether we're preaching, going through our series, like we have been in the book of 1 Corinthians, or we take a little bit of a break here and there. Mark and I are hopefully, week in and week out, never just going to tell you our opinions, because our opinions aren't worth much. But what is worth a great deal is what the scripture has to say. So today we're going to be going through a book that is right after the book of 1 Corinthians, and you might know what it's called. It's called 2 Corinthians. It's Paul's, what we have is Paul's second letter to the Corinthian church. Some say it might be his third letter. We don't know exactly. But if you want to take out your Bible, turn to 1 Corinthians, or not 1 Corinthians. If you turn to 1 Corinthians, it's the book right after that. If you know where to find that, because we've been in it so long, you'll know how to find 2 Corinthians. It's the New Testament, right about there, near the back of the Bible. If you're using a device, just search for it. It should be easy to find. We're going to be focusing in on chapter 5 this morning. In, we're going to be looking at the scripture from verses 17 to 21, but we're going to be focusing primarily on verse 21, walking through that to see why is the resurrection good news for us? Was it just Jesus showing off? Hey, look what I can do. Sucks to be you. Let's see. But So turn with me there, and before we listen to the scripture, as it's going to be read behind, let's set our hearts right to hear from God's word through prayer. Father, I thank you so much that we have the opportunity this morning to remember the words that you have given Paul to write to the Corinthian church to remind us of the amazing truth of who we are in you. I pray that you would open our ears this morning, open our eyes this morning, help us to see something maybe that we've never seen before. Help us to understand you in a way that we see your beauty, we see your majesty, we see your glory, we see all that you are. And Father, I want to pray, especially for the kids this morning, that you give them an extra measure of grace to deal with their parents. Kids who are feeling like their parents are not providing enough snacks, not giving enough who knows what, but that you would give these kids just the grace to love their parents well, to enjoy what you have for us today in, in your word, and I, I pray too for the parents that they would have an extra measure of grace. For those who aren't parents, that they would have grace for the children who are making noises, revealing to us that they are alive, that they have been blessed to be part of this church as well. Thank you for this amazing church that we get to be part of because of your work, Jesus. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. All right, let's listen as the scriptures read on the screen behind me. Reading from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 to 21. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ, God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God.
All right, verse 17. What's the magic word that we see there that gets me fired up? Therefore. Anyone who knows me knows that when we see the word therefore, we got to dive into some context because we got to figure out what in the world is Paul talking about here? What's he trying to tell us in these few verses? Because it's not just individual verses. The scripture is contextual. There's a context involved. So Paul's been explaining to these Corinthians that the world that they live in, very much like our world, it's wasting away. Our bodies day by day get older and eventually we die. Many of us feel that more surely than others. You you don't even have to be old to feel old. Sometimes we just wake up and we feel like, okay, maybe today's the day that I go to see Jesus because I slept and now my back hurts. We feel old and we feel like we're going to die. And so because of this, we groan and we long for a day where Jesus is going to change that, to fix that to get rid of all the sickness and the pain and the death. We long and hope for a time to come where we can be freed from these broken and worn out bodies, where we long for new homes that will last forever, new bodies that will endure everything. And so Paul says it's good and it's right for us to long for these things. It's good and it's right to long for the freedom from sickness, sadness, or pain. But he also says that we should long for something even greater than that, too. We should long to be reunited to God. This is an even greater longing that we should have. Because the very reason the world is as broken as it is, is because there's something wrong in the world. The the very reason we get sick and die is because something has separated us from the source of life. And that life is God himself. Now, the something that has separated us is sin. I know we talked about it on Friday that nobody likes to talk about sin, but we're going to talk about sin. Sin is our failure as people to see God for who he is. So what happens is we've believed a lie. We believe that God doesn't have our best in mind. We believe that we can be a better God than God. And it's not just, it's not just, okay, I've read some rules, I've broken them, big deal. It's like breaking the speed limit. It's just a concept. What is it? That's, not, that's not at all what sin is. It's not just breaking of some rules. It's not just doing a few bad things. Sin is willful treason against a perfect creator God, the holy God, the righteous God. And some of you might be thinking, well, that can't be all of us, right? It's just, I mean, surely somebody has not done this, right? It's not just some of us. It's not even just the majority of us. But hopefully we all know that we've all done this. We've all sinned. From the very first humans to walk to the earth to everyone in this room today, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've chosen the path of sin. We've declared with our actions and our motives that our ways are better than God's ways. This is how we live. And in light of knowing all that, in light of knowing that our bodies waste away, that we're doomed to an eventual destruction, that each breath we take brings us one breath closer to our ultimate end, Paul has this cheery bit that he wants to excite us with in verse 10. Chapter 5. He says this, I'm being a little bit sarcastic, if you see the verse already. For we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. Paul's saying there's a day coming when Jesus returns where we will have to stand before the judgment seat of Christ. The throne of God. And all that we have ever done or thought will be looked over and scrutinized. Now, when you think about that, again, don't just think about the things that you've done. But it's also the things you've thought, the things, additionally, that you should have done but didn't do. There's a lot that we're going to be judged on. So when you think about that, how many of us feel at least a little bit uncomfortable? 
I feel incredibly uncomfortable when I think about that. But as Paul continues on with this chapter, he starts speaking not just of the appropriate fear of the Lord that we should have because of this, but also the love of Christ that compels us to persuade others about this very God. So in light of that, you might be wondering, well, what are we supposed to persuade others about? Is it just that we're supposed to tell them that they're sinful? Because that part's evident. That they need to start doing good deeds so that their good deeds will outweigh their bad deeds on that day of judgment? That they're supposed to just think positive thoughts? Supposed to stop being mean to people, maybe start saying sorry a bit more often? I don't think that's it, because even in Canada, where we love to say sorry and we're not super mean, sin still abounds here. We still face death. Things are not the way it should be, even in a country as great as Canada is. But here's what was happening in the Corinthian church. As you know, if, we've been going, if you've been along with us for the ride in 1 Corinthians, that the church in Corinth was obsessed with fitting into society. They wanted to appear the wisest or the strongest in the eyes of their neighbors, their coworkers, their families. They wanted to look good. And Paul says that they saw the world through the lens of what's called the flesh, as opposed to seeing the world through the lens of the Holy Spirit of God. And it seems as though even after writing the first letter, there were still things that this church was struggling with in these same areas. Just like how we might read the Bible over and over again. We might listen to sermon after sermon, sometimes dealing with the exact same issue for five weeks in a row, where it talks about living in light of what the world has to offer us rather than what God has to offer us. And we still find ourselves doing the same thing over and over again. The truth is we all need to be reminded of these things over and over again because we're sinful. We still have that sin lurking inside of us, trying to persuade us that God's way is not necessarily the best way. We forget what's true and we end up gravitating towards the things that we've always done. But it seems as though within the church, because of this, they're, they're still judging people. They're, they're just thinking about the outside appearances. It's like they're worried so much about how people are dressed, how they spoke, what kind of job they had, or what, what kind of sin they used to struggle with. It's like you label that person and that's who they are for the rest of their life. And back in verse 12, if you have your Bible open, you can look at it. We don't have it on the screen. Paul, he's talking about how he feels the need to remind this church that he and Timothy, they're the ones who are writing this letter, that they don't look like the superstar teachers of, this day, of the day. But he says this shouldn't matter. It's like the Corinthian church is so focused on looks. They're like, well, look, everybody who teaches in Corinth, they drive BMWs, Audis, and Mercedes. And then Paul drives up in a 1999-10 Mazda protege with clutch issues. Not that I have any experience doing that. And he's like, this is not what you need to judge people on. It's not about outward appearances. If all you have to boast in is what you see on the outside, there's something about the gospel you are misunderstanding. It's the same for us. If, if all we think about is how good our kids are doing in school, how much money we make, what our house looks like, what our car is like, kind of barbecue we use, if that's what our focus is, and we say, this is how I know I'm blessed by God, then we have a flawed understanding of the gospel. Or maybe, maybe we act like everything is okay. We, we try to pretend we're not concerned about outward appearances. Oh, I don't care what kind of car I drive. I don't care what house I have. But then we just, we, we put on a fake smile about everything. We tell the world how awesome we're doing, when in reality our life is actually falling to pieces. We lie to our friends, we lie to our church, we lie to ourselves. And we cover it up using words like grace and forgiveness without actually understanding what those things truly mean. We just want to make ourselves feel like God is okay with whatever it is we're doing, or feeling, because God is a God of love, right? I'm just supposed to put on a happy face, right? 
I want people to look at me and think everything is going well. It's so easy to be just like the Corinthian church. All about appearances. So then in verse 17, Paul says that it's not just about having better stuff, looking better, or pretending like everything is amazing, but the gospel is way more than that. If all the gospel does for you is lets you say when someone asks, how's it going, you say, I'm doing great. If that's all the gospel does for you, you're missing out. So this is what he says in verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is not just about some slight improvement to your life. A better attitude, a fatter bank account, a slimmer waist. This is not what the gospel is primarily about. No, the good news is that Christians are brand new creations. It means we're not defined by what we have. We're not defined by what we do. And we're not defined by what we used to do before Jesus found us. If we are in Jesus, the old has passed away, the new has come. So we have to ask ourselves, how can this be? What makes this so? We're talking about Jesus' resurrection. How, how does that correlate to that? How does a resurrection correlate to a new creation? How do we go from sinners who have defied and defiled an understanding of who this holy, perfect, and righteous God is to being new creations? It's precisely because of what we read in verse 21. It says, For our sake he made him to be sin, who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. So I want to walk through that slowly. For our sake, that's he, or sorry, for our sake he, that's God, made him, that's Jesus, to be sin. So it starts out saying it's for our sake. For our sake, Jesus was made to be sin. So this for our sake, it, it, to me it seems like it has a double meaning. First, was that it, it was because of our sin. Because we believed the lie, because we rebelled against God. Because we continue to choose self over sin, or sorry, self over God. We choose sin over God. We choose sin over love. See, had we never sinned, Jesus wouldn't have needed to die. But secondly, for our sake means it was because God loved the world that he sent his only begotten son. It was for our sake because of God's love for sinners. Because of God's love for rebels. God could have left us in our sin. God could have destroyed us and given us exactly what we deserve. He had every right to. The scriptures say that the wages of sin is death and eternal punishment. That's what we deserve. But it was because of his love for us, for our sake. He made him to be sin. This means that Jesus took upon himself, transferred upon himself, the theological term is imputed, our sin. He became our sinfulness. Now, I want us to not rush through this part too quickly because I want us to get a real sense of the gravity of this. Remember how I wanted you to picture that day of judgment? Remember that sense of dread you were probably feeling? Here's the thing. All the ways that you were probably thinking about all the things you did that were wrong, all the times you messed up, all the times you missed the mark, all the times you failed to do the right thing or you willingly chose to do the wrong things, all of those are but a drop in the bucket compared to what God deserves from us. Jesus said that the greatest commandment is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Doesn't the God who created us and gave us his air to breathe deserve at least that much? 
And yet not a single one of us can say, even in the last 30 seconds that we've done that, even while we're listening to or preaching a sermon, not one of us has loved the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. Of all of God's creatures who have ever walked the face of the earth, no one has been able to say that they've done this fully. And to not give God the glory that he deserves, that's sin. And do we know what the scriptures tell us that sinners deserve? And I'm not just talking about the Old Testament. If you look through Deuteronomy, there's a whole list of, of things there. Curses upon curses. But maybe the New Testament things are different, right? Let's see what Jesus says about this. In the Gospel according to Mark, this is what he records Jesus saying. Starting in verse 43 of chapter 9. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your, feet, if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Now, whether Jesus is speaking here of a literal place where people burn for all eternity, or he's using it as a picture to demonstrate the painful result of God's judgment. Either way, I'm hoping none of us are like, yeah, that's what I want. Either way, we're, we are also reminded that sin has real consequences. Sin deserves death whether you're in the Old Testament or the New Testament like we're in today. Now, most people don't like hearing about the wrath of God, how God's out for his own glory. So many, so many people want, well, how could a loving God do that? How can a loving God punish people just because they're not doing what God says all the time? I feel like that, that seems a little overboard. But I think we ask ourselves the wrong question. How can a righteous God not punish sin? How can a holy God ignore sin? How can God be just if he does nothing? And consequently, on the other side, what greater love could God show than being willing to take that very punishment that we deserve? What greater sacrifice could Jesus give than to take our place and bear the full weight of God's wrath upon himself? For our sake, he made him to be sin. You see, if Jesus became sin for us, that means that on the cross, he would take the form of every sin that has been or ever will be committed against God by those whom he would save. It means Jesus would become the idolater, the adulterer, and the murderer. He would become the thief, the liar, and the cheater, the detestable, the deplorable, and the despicable. Upon Jesus would be placed all of our sin, past, present, and future. So when Jesus went to the cross, he was not only going to the cross as an enemy of the state, because he claimed to be the king, but he was also going to the cross for our sake as an enemy of God. That means that the punishment that we deserved, the wrath of God, the curse, the affliction, the devastation, the destruction, all of that would be taken by Jesus. And we're reminded again, verse 21, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so Jesus wasn't paying for our sin on top of his own. No, Jesus had been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet without sin. Think of all the times you've been tempted and you just give in. I can think of that myself, and I know it's a lot. It's hard when we're tempted to not give in, isn't it? Now imagine doing that for your whole life never once giving in. We feel a sense of relief almost 
when we give in, like we can finally, we're holding up a barbell and we can finally put it down. Jesus carried that the whole time. All the temptation after temptation after temptation. Jesus held on to it. He didn't give in, not once. Sometimes we can think, well, it's, it's easy to resist temptation for a moment, but to do that for your entire life? That's crazy. And let's, let's remember too, this isn't just the big things. Woo, didn't murder someone today. This is everything, right? Loving the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Jesus was tempted to not, Jesus was tempted to not do that. And he did that perfectly too. Jesus fulfilled this every second of every day perfectly. This is amazing. And yet this is the man who was thrust through with the wrath of God. Proverbs 17, 15 tells us, he who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the righteous are both alike an abomination to the Lord. Now the word abomination is used to indicate the vilest of sin. Doesn't it sound like that's what Jesus is doing? Doesn't it sound like he's justifying the wicked and condemning the righteous? And yet, as God himself was condemning Jesus, the perfect righteous one who had no sin, in this way too, Jesus becomes our abomination. Jesus, fully man and fully God, became an abomination for our sake. In every way, Jesus became sin for us, though he knew no sin. Jesus was substituting himself for us. He was bearing our punishment. He was taking what we deserved. But the verse isn't done yet. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. We might become the righteousness of God. Do you see that? Do you get how crazy amazing this is? You've got to ask yourself, how is this even possible? Not only are we spared from God's wrath, not only do we get our sin taken away and paid for by Jesus, but now we get to become the righteousness of God? Because of the resurrection, because Jesus defeated Satan, sin, death, and hell, because he did not stay dead, he now has the authority to give life to whomever he pleases, to give whatever he pleases of this life, his righteousness. When we become new creations, he declares what we are. We are the righteousness of God in Christ. Because of this victory, we get victory over Satan's sin, death, and hell because he lives not only is our sin paid for, but we now get this new life with him, this righteous life. We're considered righteous and we now get to be with him. So we need to ask ourselves, is there any better news than that? See, it, it was not just enough for God to say that we could be forgiven of our sin to now sit under him and serve him. It wasn't just enough that we could be given an, a fresh start so that we can now try to earn our right standing with him, with all the baggage of our past sin now cleared away, as if God is only the God of second chances. How many times have you guys heard that? God is the God of second chances. God is not the God of second chances. It's not like, okay, there, cleared away. Now, start. Let's see if you can do it this time. No. He's giving the declaration of us being perfect in his sight already. Completely perfect. We're seen and declared as righteous. We're declared part of his kingdom. It's not just that we're cleaned up so that we can make a mess again, but we're perfectly made right with God. Not just to serve him, but brought into his family as sons and daughters. Righteous in his eyes. But there's a but. Do you see it? 
It doesn't say the word but, but if you look at it closely, there's something that needs to be there for us to receive this righteousness. It's only if we're in him. You see, you don't get to be the righteousness of God if you're not in Jesus. And if it wasn't for his resurrection too, being in him wouldn't be a big deal either, right? Because if you're in Jesus, a dead guy, what does that matter? All being in him is leading to death. But he is risen, which means being in him is a big deal. This is good news for us. So we should delight in being in the one who has been raised, if indeed we are in him. See, when we're in him, that means we give up basing our goodness on our works. We give up basing our goodness on our attitudes, on our actions. We give up basing our standing on God or our standing with others based on who we are. It's not about me anymore. It's not about you anymore. When we are in him, it means we give up our very selves to be in him. My hopes, if I, am in, if I am in Jesus, my hopes are not only valid if they are Jesus' hopes for me. My desires are only valid if they are Jesus' desires for me. The resurrection reminds us that if we want to follow him, if we want to be in him, we don't get to be the Lord of our own lives anymore. It means you don't get to tell God that you're a better God than he is. There isn't room in this relationship for two masters. But he's the only one who could pay for your sin with his perfect death. And he's the only one who could then defeat death so that we could be given life and share in this amazing eternal life with him. This is what makes it good news. And this is what makes him the ruler over us too. He paid for your life with his life. So now, for those of us who are in him, our life belongs to him. Now, here's the sad part. There are many people who like the idea of being declared as righteous, being declared as good and right before God. I bet you could ask anyone out in the street, your neighbor, your coworker, if I told you you were right with God, would you, you think that's good? They'd probably be like, sure, I'll take that deal. And there are many people who like the idea of not facing the wrath of God. How many people like the idea of not going to hell? I think most people like that. At the same time, many people don't like the idea of giving up their lives. And what did Jesus say to this kind of thinking? This is how Matthew records it in his gospel account. Chapter 10, starting in verse 38. And whoever does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds his life will lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now the word in there that's, that we see as life, in the original language, it's where we get the word psyche or psychology. It's talking about ourself. It means we need to lose the self-aggrandizement, the self-actualization, we need to lose the self-interest, the self-love, the self-care. We need to give of ourselves to be in Jesus. Because we need to understand that this is what Jesus did for us on the cross. It's not like he's making us give up something that he didn't have to struggle with. No, he gave of himself entirely. But what does it say for those who do give up themselves? who lose themselves. You guys see it? Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. And the it that he's talking about is true life. Life with Jesus. Life with the one who created all things. The one who rose again. And now, if we are in him, allows us to rise into eternal life as well. Now, the interesting thing is that Jesus told this to his disciples before he went to the cross. So 
So his disciples, are, as they're hearing it, they're probably just thinking, what on the earth is Jesus talking about? Pick up our cross and follow him? Does Jesus have some kind of death wish? But what Jesus was doing was showing us the way. He was showing the way that he would pave. He didn't just say to pick up your cross, go to the cross and die. He said to follow him. And where do we follow him? We follow him death to resurrection. This is what makes resurrection good news for us. This is what makes Good Friday and Easter Sunday good news for us. Because by following after him, receiving his righteousness, we now get to attain what he attained three days after his crucifixion. We get resurrection and we get reconciliation. His death was not the end. And for those of us who are now in him, it means death is not the end for us either. That means just as Jesus physically rose from the grave, when we die, there will be a day when Jesus resurrects us as well. It's going to be awesome. And on that day, when he resurrects us, when we're standing before the judgment seat of Christ, like Paul warned us in verse 10, for those of us who are in Jesus, rather than him looking at us and saying, fit for destruction, fit for punishment, flick him out of here, he's going to say to us, and we're going to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. This is what we get. We get this because Jesus took our guilt and gave us his righteousness and proved that he could do that by rising from the grave. That means all the pain, all the sadness, death and dying, all the wrongs of this world will be done and over. And we will one day have that perfectly restored relationship with Jesus that for those of us who are in him, we truly long for. And he's going to fulfill all of our greatest desires. Because for the one who is in Jesus, our greatest desire is Jesus. Jesus himself. Like an estranged husband and an estranged wife separated because of what would seem like irreconcilable differences, Jesus pursued his bride. He didn't leave her to wallow in the sin Jesus sacrificed for her. And Jesus did every last thing necessary so that they could truly be restored and reconciled. And Jesus did this at infinite cost to himself. This is what we receive. There's no greater exchange. And because of this, I want to leave you with the, the same words of Paul at the end of verse 20. He says this, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. The offer is wide open. He is waiting to hear from you. So give Jesus your sin in exchange for his righteousness. Take that deal. And if you've done that, then it means that Jesus paid for your sin on the cross. He paid for your sin with his death. And today we get to celebrate then because Jesus didn't just die, but he rose to life so that we could re receive this amazing reward, true life with him, the greatest gift we could ever have. So let's pray and thank him. Jesus, I thank you so much for this gift. Thank you for paying the penalty of our sin yourself. Thank you for giving us your righteousness so we could stand before you pure and holy in your sight. Thanks that you could be just and the justifier. That we could be made right with God because of who you are. And Father, thank you for the resurrection of Jesus. That you rose your son to new life so that we could follow after him into our new lives. Bought by the blood of Jesus and guaranteed by his resurrection. Jesus, thank you so much. And it's in your name that we can pray and praise you and be thankful. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.